Okay, welcome. We're going to start now on um, the first part of history, which is uh, Paleolithic. And we're going to do this really quick survey and end with the Romans. And um, as this, this um, title states on this, this first PowerPoint slide, that really artistic style, these artifacts that you're looking at, they really reflect everything about the culture they exist in. And just like today, these are our music, the objects we create, the architecture we build. Everything reflects our belief systems, what uh, is important to us in culture. And so when you look at these objects, as well as think about, uh, as I'm talking about, you know, the, the characteristics of your culture during that time period, you should really be thinking to connect to the information that this really isn't separate from you because it's human history and it's how we evolved from these ancient civilizations, although they were a very, very long time ago. And to start, I went ahead on this slide and highlighted those that are vocabulary that you should be practicing and building uh, and applying to the artifacts. I do have some examples in the PowerPoint that you can review uh, as we build on this vocabulary as we go through uh, the course. So uh, I laid that out for you. And then let's just start talking about the Paleolithic period, which is the Old Stone Age. Very long time ago, a couple million years ago, long time ago. And it's going to be followed by the um, Neolithic period, the New Stone Age. So very simply, the Paleolithic period is when we were migratory, we weren't settled, we were moving around, we were moving even from one continent to another, we were just migratory period. Very nomadic, hunters, gatherers. But we did certain things. You know, we started to develop uh, communication. We started to develop uh, tools to use. And we also, as you'll see in one of these early slides, is that we developed rituals. And a ritual is something that reflects, it will come to, it will become a religion. Um, and so the ritual is things we do in a um, faith-based way that we can influence tomorrow or in the future. So that takes hold too, this idea of the ritual and influencing tomorrow because, you know, the world, nature, Paleolithic period, even now, it's, you know, sometimes it's incomprehensible. And so as humans, we very early on just developed these rituals to be coping, coping rituals. So, as you see in the first part of the book, you're going to see this image, and this is the Cave of Glasgow in France, Glasgow, France. And it's actually very interesting, this image, because it actually is significant that they put it in the beginning of the book, I think that's very significant um, because it creates a canon that this is the earliest and this is in Europe and that a canon is something that an authority or a group of authorities they decide is true they put it in textbooks it becomes a canon and so this image is a canon it is a standard this is an iconic representation therefore, of Paleolithic cave painting. Well, the problem with that is, is that there were actually earlier paintings. Much, much, much earlier. On the continent of Africa, which I'll show you. So, that's the first point. The second point is, you have to understand this. This drawing, sometimes I'll call it painting, sometimes I'll call it drawing. These drawings did not 
come before the sculpture of people made sculptures first because it's easier to pick up a piece of clay and mold a form in your hands than to have an idea about how to represent animals running and then draw that and then create that illusion on a wall. So by the time we started, so sculpture comes first, tools, sculpture, making things with our hands, and then this concept of this idea of making illusions, illusionistic images, is actually a big leap in our evolution um, that took place. All right, so, and I'm gonna come back to this because we're gonna talk about it in detail. But the first thing I wanna do is show you this is actually the earliest cave painting. And this is the sand art in Southern Africa, the sand tribe. And the sand tribe is, we say that Africa is the cradle of humankind because the earliest remains have, found been, has, have been found there. Um, as well as this one tribe, the San tribe, all are, is the basis for all our gene pool, our gene pool. Although traces of, of them are not in us, traces of us are stem from them. So this is actually one of the earliest cave paintings. And in this, you see the same thing as the other. These are animals. So the subject of these artifacts, or the subject of the work of art, you know, are very important because the subject in these, these prehistoric cultures as well as these other civilizations that is what is important to them and the subject here are animals animals are important for survival it's a migratory period so there are hunters and gatherers but they also these early images showed dance and so for the San culture, dance was very important and it was part of ritual. And so those are the two images that you will see. And now when you see these little figures dancing, those are like little stick figures to me. But still important. The animals were more important because they're more representational where these figures are sort of like stick figures. Um, and so by the time you even have this kind of image making, you can see that there, we speculate that this ritual takes place in the form of dance. As well, prior to the Cave of Lascaux in France, these are earlier as well because the earliest cave paintings are from Africa and Australia. So there's a myth breaker for you. Now we're going to get back to this, this iconic image. And now this is in Europe and this wall painting, cave painting is deep, 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 deep in this cave. And it, this is only part of it. It's very huge, huge interior space in the cave. And there's actually even animals that are as uh, large scale, like closest to the size of the animal. Um, and these, these images on the wall, if you went to this space, and these, by the way, were not discovered until 20th century just by accident because they were so deep in the cave. But in the center of this space, there's a fire pit, an actual fire pit where people during this period would sit around, early humans sit around. And so you can only imagine the effects of being in this dark, dark cave, the bowels of this cave. And here's this fire flickering and those animals as the light hits that surface are sort of moving and it's part, we speculate, then it is ritual. We speculate it's ritual because there are spear marks 
on the, the cave, on the walls of the cave, where the animals are. So what's occurring is these warriors or these uh, early human beings are throwing their spears against the wall to hit the animals. To what? To influence hunting. So the purpose is ritualistic, to improve hunting. As well, the subject are animals, because animals were important for survival. We do have a couple of stick figures. We didn't actually have a handprint, which is sort of cool. But predominantly, it's it's uh, very few, very few figures, little stick figures, and one of them has a little arrow uh, going into it. Not like as um, vigorous with figures as the uh, African cave paintings. This lacks very few um, figures, human figures. So um, that is your first slide to know, and you should be able to describe that using the uh, visual art vocabulary, which I believe I have in this. Um, here it is. So I've covered part of it up with my video. But so this is sort of how I would write this. You don't have to, but I'm just showing you how I would use the language that you want to incorporate in paragraph form. So I would say, first of all, I would make sure that I <clears throat> give the title and the period. And then I would say something like this. The style on the cave of Lascaux is linear and representational. The two-dimensional subject of animals are drawn using natural substances like chalk, charcoal, dyes. The natural substances are colorful to capture the likeness of animals. So you see, I just go on and on using that vocabulary. Uh, and you can use it, you know, and organize it in any way that, that you would like to do. So that's an example. Now, then we come to this spine lake. So what is this? This is Paleolithic sculpture. And I told you that they, they were migratory, so they're not going to erect huge permanent sculptures. Excuse me. And this sculpture of the Venus of Willendorf, that is Willendorf, Austria. This is in Austria. Uh, Venus, the artist did not say, hey, this is the Venus of Willendorf. Uh, she's given the name Venus because that's the goddess of love with the Romans, and um, she was found in Willendorf, Austria. Now, I already said that sculpture comes before drawing, so this is earlier. This one is like around 30,000 BC, and the painting, wall painting, is about 15,000 BC, give or take a couple thousand years. So, what is the subject? Female. Well, her hands are not there, her feet are not there, it's not a portrait, but she has large breasts and large belly, and that's because she's pregnant. So this is a fertility goddess. So what is important that's going to be a subject? Animals and increasing the tribe. So... You have this representational figure, and it is very, very small in scale. You could put it in your hand. You could just carry it in your hand. It's that small. Because they would carve these and then they would take it with them during this period. So we're going to see um, some other Venus figures, and they change. Uh, depending on the region, and become very stylized and very abstracted. Okay, now we're going to leave those early Paleolithic um, works, artifacts found in Europe, and now we're going to go to Mesopotamia.
and some of you more than likely have had history courses. So, you know, this information is probably very familiar to you or, you know, you took a core, a history course somewhere else. So this probably isn't news to you. It's just a review. So let me review it. You know, geography is important because different civilizations flourished like the Mesopotamian civilizations as well as Egypt because of geography. Egypt had the Nile, and the Nile was very abundant with fish. In Mesopotamia, you have two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. And not only do you have two rivers that flood and leave this silt after they flood, the silt is good for farming, and that's that green area. So we say Mesopotamia is the cradle of civilization, it's the Neolithic period where they are stationary, they're building, they're domesticating animals, they're farming, they are um, building architecture. This location is Jordan today, Jordan, Iraq, around those areas, and Iran. So this isn't 7,000. The, the um, Mesopotamian civilization, starting with the Sumerians, is around 3,500 BC, 3,000 BC. Now, this is a very interesting region in ancient history because you don't just look at some of the civilizations. This region was a warring region. 50 years to 200 years, and then they would, one group would conquer another group. The Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Persians, and others, Neo-Babylonians. But it's very interesting because they were always like warring, but they didn't, they assimilated. When the Akkadians captured or um, they kept, well, and they conquered rather, the Sumerians, they didn't, you know, decimate the place. They didn't annihilate, they assimilated. And so you'll see their artifacts are very similar. Um, distracted, and then they go towards realism when you have the first ruler, Akkadian, Akkadian ruler Sargon. So we'll look at that. Now, in talking about that, it's very interesting because Egypt, now Egypt came along a little later in terms of its civilization than the Sumerians, and that was just because, like I said, the Nile was so abundant. But it's very interesting because Egypt pretty much had the same history for 3,000 years. The only time it really changed or altered drastically was with one pharaoh that was actually monotheistic, Agnaton, and of course his, his wife was Nefertiti. Agnaton believed also in monotheism, so he was unusual. But other than him, Egypt pretty much stayed the same for 3,000 years. Very, very stable. It had some economic problems here and there, you know, during some centuries, but they were very, very stable, unchanging. And their work, like the pyramids, they built things huge because that indicates stability, permanence. Where this region, the Mesopotamian region, was always shifting, always these tribes warring between each other. So, this is what... Um, I was talking to you about that these are just some of the civilizations we're going to cover. The Sumerians, the Akkadians, and the Babylonians. Assyrians conquered the Babylonians, and the Persians conquered the Assyrians, and then the Romans conquered the Persians. Actually, it was Alexander, Alexander the Great. So, we're going to begin with the Sumerians and what occurred was particularly, you know, 
unique. Um, they lived in communities. They were the first civilization in this region. And they made significant contributions to human history. You have writing. And that at the bottom here, this is a um, this is part of the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, an epic story, and it's carved in stone. That's just part of it. And it's written in cuneiform, whereas Egyptians use hieroglyphics. You know, there were many inventions and many new ideas with the Sumerians, but there were equally the same amount earlier than the Sumerians on the continent of Africa that we're not going to talk about in this course. So I don't want you to think that, you know, first cave paintings were in Europe, and then the cradle civilization, and all this, this civilization occurred in, in uh, only Mesopotamia, no. It was also occurring earlier on, in the continent, on the continent of Africa. So, you have with the Sumerians, you have writing, which is cuneiform, and that means you can keep records. You have development of a God-man relationship, and you have architecture. This sculpture right there, that is a zugalot, and it's also called symbolic mountain. It exists today, and let me show you some pictures of that. And it's made of sun-dried brick, and the top is off because it's just worn by the weather, weather and time. And in this place, this, this, this uh, architecture, you would have, they would be storing grain. They would um, have a place where a priest would be. And you have a priest, that means a god man relationship. And very simply, that means that when you have a priest, you have someone that is closer to a god or gods, and these were poly, polytheistic many gods, than you. So when you have a priest, you're starting to have this god-man relationship. In Africa, it would be a shaman. You also have city-state governing, which just mean, which means that each of these cities, Ur, or Sumer, in the Sumerian civilization, they had their own god because they believed in many gods. And they also cooperated with each other. They would store grain and they would share. If there was a problem, some kind of problem that needed to be resolved, then they would elect an assembly, they would take care of it, and then whoever headed that assembly, that assembly would disperse. So that's the kind of governing that took place. Um, we call that city-state. So this is some 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 images of the Azugalot. And this is the one on the earlier slide, where this is a uh, schematic drawing that this is what probably the top looked like. It it's almost a pyramid. The sloped walls, the early pyramids in Egypt, actually look this way, like the pyramid made of King Zoser. And it looks very Aztec, doesn't it, as well. So this is what exists today in Iraq. And I just included this um, not to, you know, inspire patriotism or propaganda or anything, but just to show you that when we, <clears throat> we were over there in Iraq, and this is American soldiers actually walking up that national treasure that has existed all these thousands of years. That's remarkable. So then you've got these boats. Like, what are these? All right. Now this is where we have moved from realism, those animals on the cave wall, to now we've got these abstracted figures. And students, I can't, I don't know why. The West, we're Western, is always leaned towards representational and realism. And the Eastern part of the world has always leaned towards abstraction. 
and I'm doing it today. So these sculptures you would see or find in a zoograph, and you would be bringing in uh, oil, maybe some wine and some vegetables, and you would you would put it like an altar. And these figures are also um, hierarchical in that the most important are the tallest. And so this is the tall one here. This is the uh, um, god of vegetation. And then you've got some, just some regular folks. The shorter people would be just people. So this is the kind of figurative sculpture that they had, very abstracted. And it's a formal stance. That's very important because all the sculpture in the ancients uh, with the ancients were formal. It's not until the Greeks that it becomes informal, relaxed pose. A formal pose is like straight up, like at attention in the army. Relaxed is like at ease. So as we describe these, we would say, well, they are abstract. They have, and they do have large staring eyes. Um, the male wears a, um, a skirt, is bare chested. He has repetition in the beard, repeating, a repeating crimped beard. And the women have are very similar in this formal stance, a prayer position, by the way, and they have these dresses on. Mm -hmm. yep. So those are statues from the Abbey Temple, and they're made um, in clay, baked clay. Well, this is the Code of Hammurabi. And uh, apparently we've skipped the Akkadians and we have moved directly to the Babylonians. Now, the Babylonians, you know, when you have a culture, there is the pinnacle of that culture and we call that high culture. So the Babylonians are high culture in Mesopotamia. Because this is the top part of a unified law code, seven foot tall stone. And Hammurabi, this is him accepting the law code. And the law code is written in cuneiform. I'll show in the next slide, 282 laws. So first unified law code is occurring in Babylon. That's one of its contributions. Um, so if I go to the next slide, this shows you that seven foot stele, that piece of stone. And then this is a close up. That's the cuneiform, those laws carved into that. And actually the law code was very important because it not only was the first unified law code, but it protected women. Now men had multiple wives, but if a man left his wife and children, then he had to pay alimony. And in some respects, they were protected from abuse. But at the same time, you know, it was very strict where um, if a woman committed adultery, she was put to death. If you stole, if you bear fault witness, you were put to death. So it was also very, very strict. Um, but saving grace is that uh, early on um, the rights of women were being protected somewhat. So that's uh, King Hammurabi, and that is the um, stele of Hammurabi. So we leave the ancient Near East. Again, this is just a survey. We're just like, sailing through ancient history. And Egypt, I call Egypt art of the afterlife because everything was geared towards the afterlife. So here you have these sculptures and monuments that are actually tombs, these pyramids. Um, and so, you know, they believe their Pharaoh to be part divine. And this idea of the afterlife was central to Egyptian life. 
over 2,000 gods and goddesses. It was like crazy polytheistic. Um, and so the pyramids are actually tombs, and you probably know about them. And, you know, they were broken into, and so um, they moved away from pyramids to rock cut tombs. But these are the pyramids of Giza. And the pharaoh and his belongings and slaves would probably have been, uh, well, would have been uh, put into this pyramid to be there for his trip to the afterlife. Mm -hmm. Now, this is actually what's important. Because we're going to go to the Greeks next. And the Greeks are still very influential on Western culture. You know, Aristotle, Plato, uh, and other other reasons. So this is Egyptian sculpture, and this is Mycerinus, the Pharaoh Mycerinus and his queen. Again, this is a formal stance. The Pharaoh would have it's called late hip movement, which is left foot forward, almost moving, wearing a skirt, bare chested, clenched fists. He's going to not stare directly at you because, after all, he's the pharaoh, so he has a distant gaze. And then his queen is standing there, left foot forward, formal stance, what I would call wet t-shirt dress. That sort of hugs and defines the shapes of her form. So this is much more realistic, beautifully stylized. Um, and that's a closed form, which means there's no spaces between the legs. The arms don't come out away from the body. And so the only sculptures would be of pharaohs, queens, gods, goddesses, maybe a scribe. Um, but those would be the subject. Or, um, like I said, gods or goddesses. This is actually going to be very important because the Greeks are next. That's very different than what we just looked at, because this is informal. This is not. This is not a frontal view. It is not a closed form. You see space between the legs. By the way, this structure here is for support because this is marble. You can't balance that large figure on those two ankles. So you're going to see support right there. And this is much more realistic. It's actually idealized. Very different than Sumerian, Babylonian, Egyptian. The Greeks were different because the Greeks were humanists. And they were concerned with what makes us human. And that's why he's on Drake, by the way. Totally in Drake, because it was about a self-consciousness um, and focusing on humanity, and so it was about, you know, um, the physical, it was about the conceptual. Now, there's four periods, and the classical is the high art period. And that's when you have Plato, Aristotle, and um, you know, mathematicians. And then the Hellenistic is, is the Hellenistic is moving into that Roman period, uh, towards Roman period, and then of course they were conquered by the Romans. So I want to look at these because actually they're very important and what they, how they influenced what was made in this country during the neoclassical period. So, before I go there, look at this. This is archaic Greece, directly influenced by Egyptian sculpture. Here, this is not, this is kuros, which means you. They'd be all over the city, Athens. Kuros would be a maiden, and she would have like a... Um, Address on like this. So look at this. Left foot forward, clenched fist, 
pretty, you know, um, you have an open form with just the closed form, um, but it's a formal stance, just like my CMS, Pharaoh my CMS. But how do we know that's not Egyptian? Because very simply, the figure is undraped. That's why. Again, that tells you a lot about a culture. And so, um, you know, what the subjects of Greek culture would be youth, male youth, female youth, athletes and warriors. Whereas with the Romans, they're going to be orators and leaders and generals. Very different. So this shows you, this is very important. You think, oh, Egypt, Greeks, hoorah. Well, e Egypt influenced the Greeks in many ways. So look at this slide. This shows you the development of Greek sculpture. This is Koros early on. This is Koros, more realistic, but still latent movement, clenched fist. And finally, and this is archaic, geometric period. They just have little bronze figures. It's not as significant as the archaic period, and this is classical. We're going to talk a lot about that because the classical period, so much of what we copied is from copying this style, this idealized style. Um, and this is Spear Bear. He is his, uh, he's an athlete, a warrior, and right there would have been a wooden spear, which is missing. Um, and then here is the, the Hellenistic period in Greek history, which is very different than this. So you can see in comparison, this is still restrained movement. This is dramatic movement. And as you log into Canvas, this is what you see right here, a close-up of that right there. Lacoon and his sons. It's from the story of the Trojan War. They're being eaten. Eaten is just part of it, consumed by that snake. So stylistically, we're going to look at that very closely. Very different. Very different. So, Spear Bear. What are the characteristics of classical sculpture? First of all, it is informal. And you have what we call contrapposto. Contrapposto is the S-curve in our body because of our spine. And so we can, you know, twist like that. It's idealized. The Greeks idealized because their idea, their, it, the purpose was to come up with, as well as with, you know, Plato and Aristotle, they were working towards this idea of what is perfection. What is the ideal? And so this is very idealized, always cut, always youthful, um, very athletic in appearance. They came up with a system of proportions that they felt were idealistic. It's usually about eight and a half heads. And again, the subjects were only warriors, gods and goddesses and athletes. Still restrained movement compared to Hellenistic, but more movement than the Egyptians or the archaic period. And so this idealism is about simplicity and harmony. Okay? Now, this is the Parthenon. And it is the epitome. This is what's left of the Greek temple, the Parthenon. And it is the epitome of their idea of perfection. 
And as you can see these columns, this is reminiscent of exactly what we had in Washington. All these columns, these pediments, um, these are ruins. This temple, um, the Parthenon, would have been way up on a hill so you could see it up from Athens. And it would have had uh, uh, sort of like a box in there and that would have been, uh, the only thing in there would have been Athena, the goddess of war. And these are actually, um, you know, I'm not going to require you know these. I want to go over them, though, because um, you may, you may want to know some of these. So let me just start here. This is, and this is actually very important, this is a post and lintel system, building system. And that just means that here's a post. And here's a lentil, and it's using gravity, where the Romans are going to adopt the arch principle. That's important, because the Romans were civil engineers. Any running band like this is called a frieze. And then when you see an overhang on a building like that, that's a cornice. A cornice is an overhang. And then you have a column. And there's three parts to a column. There's a base. There's the column itself, called the shaft. And then this is the capital. And there's all different types of capitals. Uh, this is just a very simple one, almost like a, um, you know, very squarish. And then this column, you can see here, is fluted. It's carved into it. And in tassis just means that these are tapered, these columns, because the, it's to create this illusion of the weight of this roof line on this column. So you see that it's thicker at the bottom, like it's pushing down. Well, why is that important? Because if it was like a piece of PVC pipe, totally straight, it would look mechanical. Now, a piaster is not here, it's half a column. We'll look at that on um, the, uh, I'm not sure if we, yeah, on the Colosseum. It would be a half a column, not a supporting column. Now, basilica is just the floor plan. It's a rectangular floor plan, basilica. Now, this is about perfection and order and repetition. So there is the flutes, the flutes on this column depends upon the width of the column. Notice how it's spaced evenly. Repeat, 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 repeat. And this is part of the order that the Greeks preferred that was about this idea of harmony and perfection. Okay? Repeat. Now we come to the Hellenistic period. And this is Lakun, that's the title. And this is still idealized. Like, look at that guy with his sons. He's still cut. But the Hellenistic, it's not ideal. This is not an ideal situation to be consumed by a snake. So the Hellenistic period is that period when it becomes very much more international. All these different cultures have moved into Athens. And it is a period of the opposite of classical, where classical was conceptual, the idea of order and perfection. This is about drama, emotion, sensuous dramatic, the opposite, the restraint of the classical versus the drama of the Hellenistic. Very sensuous in this action and emotional, very emotional subjects. And you had a variety of subjects. Now you see elderly beggar women, you would never see that in the classical period.
And lastly, we come to the Romans who conquer the Greeks. Again, this is just a support. And at this fellow here, the Romans could not improve on sculpture. The Greeks had it down. The Romans were civil engineers, and that was their, that is what they gave to humankind, is civil engineering, like aqueducts to bring water into Rome just by using a little bit of an angle and gravity. They brought water into Rome for 50 miles in these aqueducts, and some are still existing today, big arches supporting it. And so they copied the Greek stylistically, but their subject was not athlete. Their subjects were what was important to them, which is orators, generals, plumage of columns. They're just huge columns which, de which depict a, a war that took place by a particular general. So you do not see generals orators with the Greeks. So this cannot be Greek. And there's a term called verism, which is they want to make it very realistic. So this is Augustus. Title Augustus. This is the Roman civilization. He's wearing Roman armor. This is our last slide. Now, does this look like Washington or not? called the Pantheon in Rome. And so here, what the, the Romans have done is they've copied the Greeks. Now here is a capital. We said a column has three parts, a shaft. This shaft has no flutes. This is the base. And this capital are actually Corinthian, which is like green. OK? This is your pediment, which is the triangular shape at the end of a roof line. If a porch has it, if your porch has a pediment, that's that triangular shape. And here is a cornice. So what is different about this is, is that this structure on the back uses a dome principle and is very elaborate. And that is Roman. And I'm sorry I didn't put a slide in that one too, because it's amazing. This is Greek influence. And you can't see this huge dome up there and what's inside. But this is based on the civil engineering principle of the arch. So we end with the Romans in this section. Um, and so you'll need to go back through, start writing about those different artifacts, pulling the, that vocabulary out. And then I'll tell you what your theme is going to be uh, for this section when you write that paper.